In a corner of a dive bar, Tom sat alone. A grizzled detective in his late forties, his sharp, hawk-like eyes missed little. The bar, a refuge for the city's forgotten, was filled with the usual sounds of clinking glasses and muffled conversations. The scent of stale beer and cigarette smoke lingered in the air, a familiar comfort to Tom. His gaze wandered, landing on a man who sharply stood out from the bar's usual clientele. This man was too polished, his suit too immaculate for the dingy surroundings. He moved with an unsettling fluidity, each gesture executed with an unnatural precision. His smile, though warm, didn't quite reach his eyes, which remained cold, detached. Tom's interest peaked as the stranger leaned in to whisper something to a well-known local politician, a regular at the bar known for his loud, boisterous laughter. But tonight, the politician's usual demeanor had vanished. He looked unsettled, his eyes darting around nervously before he stood up and left the bar in a hurry. Odd, Tom muttered to himself, his fingers wrapped around a glass of whiskey, the ice cubes gently clinking. He took a slow sip, the liquid burning its way down his throat. His eyes never left the stranger, who now sat alone, a faint smile playing on his lips as if relishing a private joke. Tom's instincts, honed by years on the force, buzzed with a sense of unease. This was more than just a curious anomaly in his local haunt. He sensed a story lurking beneath the surface, a mystery that piqued his detective's curiosity. Who was this man? And what was his business with the politician? The bar's neon sign flickered, casting an eerie glow on the stranger's face. For a moment, Tom felt as if he was looking at someone, or something, wearing a human mask, a creature from a world far removed from the smoky confines of this bar. Shaking off the thought as a trick of light and shadow, Tom remained focused, his mind already weaving threads of inquiry. The stranger, seemingly oblivious to Tom's scrutiny, ordered another drink, his movements graceful and assured. Tom knew this was the beginning of something significant, a puzzle he was determined to piece together. He took another sip of his whiskey, the detective in him fully awakened, ready to dive into the unknown. The morning sun had barely risen over the city when Tom received the call. The politician from the bar found dead in his uptown apartment. Tom's gut twisted. He knew this was no coincidence. He drove to the scene, his mind racing, the image of the stranger from the bar etched in his thoughts. The politician's apartment was a scene of deceptive normality. There were no signs of struggle, no evidence of forced entry. The body lay on the bed, an expression of bewildered terror frozen on its face. Tom stood there surveying the room, his detective instincts kicking into high gear, the autopsy report later that day brought a chilling discovery. A strange, fibrous substance was found laced through the politician's brain, unlike anything the coroner had seen before. It was neither organic nor synthetic, a puzzle in its own right. Tom, with a newfound urgency, started digging into recent arrivals in the city. He scoured through customs records, airline manifests and hotel registries, Hours turned into days, as Tom's office became cluttered with papers and photographs, a map of connections starting to form on the wall. He noticed a pattern. Several recent arrivals had similar profiles, impeccable credentials, but with backgrounds that were difficult to verify. They had integrated into key positions across the city, in politics, finance and technology sectors. And at the centre of this web, was the stranger from the bar, identified as a foreign diplomat named Alexander Koenig. Tom's instinct, a constant buzz in the back of his mind, told him that these were not mere coincidences. There was something sinister at play, something that went beyond espionage or corporate sabotage. The fibrous substance in the politician's brain was a clue to a much larger, more ominous puzzle. The detective in Tom couldn't let this go, he felt he was on the brink of uncovering something monumental, something that could shake the very foundations of what he knew to be true. He made calls, pulled in favours, and kept digging, each piece of information adding to the growing sense of unease. 
As the investigation deepened, Tom's nights became restless, plagued with dreams of shadowy figures and unworldly whispers. Yet each morning he returned to his work, driven by a need to uncover the truth. The stranger, Alexander Koenig, was just the beginning, and Tom was determined to unveil the mystery he represented. The city went about its business, oblivious to the undercurrents of danger that Tom was slowly uncovering. The city's neon lights flickered in the damp evening as Tom stalked the shadowy alleys of the downtown district. His detective's intuition had led him here, following a tip about the elusive Alexander Koenig's whereabouts. The air was dense with the smell of rain and garbage. As he turned a corner, there he was. The stranger from the bar, Alexander Koenig, standing in the dim light, almost as if waiting for him. Tom's heart pounded in his chest, his hand instinctively reaching for the gun holstered under his coat. The alley was deserted, the only sounds the distant hum of traffic and the occasional drip of water from a leaking pipe. Alexander Koenig, I presume. Tom called out, his voice steady despite the adrenaline coursing through his veins. The stranger turned, his face breaking into a calm, creepy smile. It was a smile that didn't reach his eyes, eyes that seemed to hold galaxies of secrets. Detective, he said, his voice smooth and unnervingly composed. You're delving into matters beyond your comprehension. Tom stepped closer, his senses on high alert. What did you do to the politician? What's this about? He demanded, trying to keep Koenig focused to catch any flicker of guilt or fear. You won't understand what's coming, detective, Koenig said, his tone almost pitying. Your efforts are commendable but futile. Before Tom could react, Koenig moved. It was a blur of motion, impossibly fast and fluid. Tom lunged, but he was too late. Koenig was gone, disappearing into the shadows as if he were made of them. Tom gave chase, but it was no use. Koenig had vanished into the maze of alleys and back streets. Breathing heavily, Tom leaned against the damp wall, his mind racing. That encounter, brief as it was, had shaken him. There was something deeply unsettling about Koenig, something more than just the usual menace of a criminal. His movements, his words, and that chilling smile. It was as if Tom had come face to face with something not entirely human. A chill ran down Tom's spine, a mix of fear and excitement. This was no ordinary case, no ordinary suspect. He was dealing with something extraordinary, possibly even extraterrestrial. The next phase of Tom's investigation brought him to the cluttered, book-lined office of Dr. Claire Turner, a renowned biologist specialising in extraterrestrial life. Her work had gained respect in recent years, with the increasing likelihood of alien existence. The room smelled of old paper and coffee. Dr. Turner, a woman in her late fifties with a sharp gaze and a no-nonsense demeanour, listened intently as Tom recounted his findings. Her eyes widened slightly at the mention of the fibrous substance found in the politician's brain. Let me see the samples, she said, her voice filled with skepticism and intrigue. Tom handed her the sealed container with the sample. She placed it under her advanced microscope, her fingers moving deftly over the controls. Finally, she leaned back, removing her glasses. This is unlike anything I've ever seen, she began, her voice measured. The cellular structure, the way it interacts with human neural tissue, it's clearly extraterrestrial. Tom felt a chill run through him. The reality of what he was dealing with was beginning to sink in. So, these aliens, they're here. Among us, he asked, trying to keep his voice steady. Dr. Turner nodded gravely. It appears so. And what's more troubling, she continued, is that they can mimic us, look like us. This substance, it's not just biological, it's a tool, a method of infiltration. Her words hit Tom like a physical blow. An alien species that could look human, moving undetected through society. The stranger from the bar, Koenig, was not just a foreign agent, he was something else entirely. They're here, and they can look like us, Dr. Turner said again, her voice tinged with fear. 
She explained how the fibrous material seemed to interface directly with the human nervous system, suggesting a level of biotechnological advancement far beyond human capabilities. Tom's mind raced with the possibilities. If these aliens could look like anyone, how deep did this infiltration go? What was their endgame? The pieces of the puzzle were slowly coming together, but the picture they formed was more disturbing than anything he had imagined. Thank you, Dr. Turner, Tom said, his voice firm despite the turmoil inside him. This information is invaluable. We need to find out how widespread this is. Together, they formed a formidable team, his detective skills complementing her scientific expertise. Their first task was to map out the network of mimics. Tom pulled strings within the police department to access surveillance footage, phone records and financial transactions, while Claire used her scientific contacts to gather more obscure, specialised information. Their days and nights blurred into long sessions of data analysis and strategy meetings in Claire's cluttered office. Piece by piece, they assembled a terrifying picture. The mimics were not random infiltrators. They were strategically placed in positions of power and influence. Politicians, business leaders, even high-ranking law enforcement officials. The network was vast and insidious. Each discovery sent shockwaves of dread through Tom. The structure of society as he knew it was being manipulated by an alien force with unknown intentions. They're planning something big, Tom concluded one evening, poring over a web of connections sprawled across the office wall. Claire, looking over a stack of reports, nodded in agreement. The pattern was too deliberate, the placements too strategic for this to be mere observation or passive infiltration. But what could their endgame be? Tom and Claire speculated long into the night. Were they preparing for a full-scale invasion, an overthrow of human governance, or something more subtle and insidious? The lack of concrete answers was maddening. The alliance between Tom and Claire grew stronger with each passing day. They were two very different minds. He, driven by instinct and experience. She, by logic and scientific inquiry. But their shared determination to uncover the truth created a bond of mutual respect and purpose. Tom also knew they needed to tread carefully. If the mimics were as deeply embedded as they feared, there was no telling who might be watching or listening. They operated in secret, using burner phones and coded messages, meeting in person whenever possible to avoid electronic surveillance. Despite their precautions, there was always an undercurrent of danger. They knew they were up against an enemy that was not only powerful, but also entirely unknown. The rules of this game were being written by the Mimics and Tom and Claire were playing catch-up. Through a combination of Claire's scientific contacts and Tom's law enforcement resources, they learned of a high-profile event that was to be a clandestine meeting ground for the Mimics. It was a gala hosted by a prominent tech mogul, rumoured to be one of the key figures in the Mimic network. The gala, under the guise of a charity event, would draw influential figures from across the city. Realising this was their chance to gather first-hand intelligence, Tom and Claire devised a plan to infiltrate the event. The risk was immense. Being surrounded by entities capable of perfect human imitation was dangerous enough. But if their cover was blown, the consequences could be fatal. Yet the opportunity was too crucial to pass up. Claire used her scientific acclaim to secure invitations, fabricating a research grant related to the tech mogul's interests. Meanwhile, Tom pulled in a favour from an old friend in the force who had expertise in undercover operations. They needed to blend in seamlessly, their true intentions hidden behind the facade of wealthy donors interested in the mogul's philanthropic ventures. On the night of the gala, Tom and Claire arrived dressed in formal attire. Tom, usually more comfortable in his worn detective's coat, wore a tailored tuxedo, while Claire was elegant in a floor-length gown. Beneath their polished exteriors, however, they were armed with concealed recording devices and weapons, just in case. The grandeur of the venue was overwhelming. As they mingled with the crowd, Tom's senses were on high alert. He scrutinized every face, every conversation, searching for any sign, 
any clue that could betray a mimic. Claire, for her part, engaged in discussions about technology and science, using her expertise to probe for information and gauge reactions. Their plan was to gather as much intel as possible. Names, plans, anything that could give them an edge. Tom's experience in covert operations served them well, guiding Claire through the nuances of undercover work. While her sharp intellect and scientific knowledge allowed her to engage convincingly with the high-profile guests. As the evening progressed, Tom felt the weight of the situation more acutely. The opulence of the event, the laughter and the clinking of glasses seemed surreal, a thin veneer over the dangerous game they were playing. One mistake, one slip in their cover story, and they could be exposed, potentially jeopardizing not just their mission, but their lives. Despite the danger, Tom and Claire worked with precision and caution, gathering snippets of conversations, noting interactions, and identifying key players. The atmosphere was charged with an undercurrent of something unspoken, an invisible web of connections that they were just beginning to unravel. The gala was in full swing as Tom and Claire moved through the opulent halls of the venue, a grandiose mansion that epitomized wealth and influence. Crystal chandeliers cast a soft glow over the guests, who were adorned in designer attire and sparkling jewels. The air smelled like expensive perfume mingling with the aroma of gourmet cuisine being served on silver platters. Tom and Claire played their parts convincingly, engaging in small talk and laughter, all the while scanning the room for any sign of unusual activity. Their senses were heightened, every gesture and word around them potentially holding deeper meaning. As they circulated among the guests, they picked up snippets of conversations that seemed innocuous to untrained ears, but held sinister undertones for those who knew what to listen for. They overheard mentions of Phase 2 and The Harvest, phrases that sent a shiver down Tom's spine. These were not mere corporate buzzwords. They were code names for plans of an alien agenda. Claire, under the pretense of freshening up, slipped away to plant surveillance devices in strategic locations around the mansion. Tom, meanwhile, continued to mingle, keeping an eye on the entrance to a private room where several individuals, including the tech mogul, had discreetly gathered. The guarded expressions and secretive nature of this group confirmed his suspicions that these were key players in the Mimic network. Tom positioned himself near the room, pretending to admire a piece of art while eavesdropping. He caught fragments of conversation about resource acquisition, integration strategies, and something about a timetable being accelerated. Each word felt like a piece of a puzzle slowly forming a terrifying picture. As Claire rejoined him, they shared a quick, discreet exchange. I planted the bugs, she whispered. Whatever they're planning, we'll have a record of it. They continued their charade, all the while acutely aware of their situation. Tom's heart raced. They were in the midst of the enemy's lair, surrounded by beings who looked human but were anything but. The evening progressed, and the guests began to depart, leaving Tom and Claire with a trove of covertly gathered information. As they left the mansion, the night air felt cold and sharp against their skin. They had successfully infiltrated the inner circle of the Mimic Network and uncovered hints of a grand, ominous plan. As they drove away, the mansion receding into the night, Tom's mind was ablaze with thoughts. Phase 2 and the Harvest, what did these terms mean? They had pieces of the puzzle, but the full picture was still elusive. One thing was clear. The mimics were orchestrating something that could spell catastrophe for mankind. The sense of accomplishment Tom and Claire felt as they drove away from the gala was abruptly shattered. Just as they were discussing their next move, a black van surged out of a side alley, cutting them off. Before they could react, more vehicles boxed them in. Men in dark suits, their movements unnaturally coordinated, emerged swiftly. Tom reached for his gun, but it was too late. He and Claire were dragged out of their car. He tried to fight back, but his attackers were unnervingly strong. 
their grips like iron vices. Claire, equally overwhelmed by the swift, silent assailants, could only exchange a glance of shock and fear with Tom before they were subdued. Blindfolded and bound, they were hustled into one of the vans. The vehicle took off at high speed, the turns and stops disorienting them. Tom's mind raced, his detective instincts trying to piece together their location, but it was futile. The precision and swiftness of the ambush suggested that the mimics had been monitoring them closely, waiting for the right moment to strike. When the van finally came to a halt, Tom and Claire were led down what felt like a series of corridors. The air was cooler here, the echo of their footsteps suggesting an underground facility. The blindfolds were removed, revealing a hallway lined with unmarked doors. The sterility of the place sent a chill down Tom's spine. They were pushed into a room resembling an interrogation chamber. The man who greeted them was chillingly familiar. The stranger from the bar. The mimic leader they had seen at the gala. He stood there with a sinister grin, his eyes betraying a cold, predatory intelligence. Welcome, Detective Tom, Dr. Clare, he said, his voice smooth and unnerving. You've been quite the thorn in our side, but in a way, I'm pleased you've uncovered us. It saves us the trouble of fetching you when the time comes. Tom glared at him, anger mingling with his fear. What do you want from us? He demanded. The leader's smile widened. What we want is simple. We wish to exist, to thrive. Your planet, your species, offers unique opportunities, but your resistance, your refusal to accept the inevitable is problematic. Claire, her face pale but her voice steady, spoke up. You can't just invade a planet, manipulate its inhabitants. People will fight back. Ah, uh, but that's where you're mistaken, Doctor, the mimic leader replied. We've been here for years, shaping your societies, your governments. The invasion is already over. You just haven't realized it yet. He turned and left the room, leaving them with two guards. Enjoy your stay, he called over his shoulder. You'll be here for the foreseeable future. There's much to discuss, much to prepare for. As the door locked behind him, Tom and Claire exchanged worried glances. They were in the heart of the enemy's stronghold, prisoners of a species whose capabilities were still largely unknown to them. Their discovery, their entire mission, was at risk of being buried forever in this hidden facility. Tom and Claire were kept in isolation for what felt like hours, the silence of the room amplifying their anxiety. Finally, the door opened and the mimic leader entered flanked by his emotionless guards. The air in the room grew heavier, charged with a foreboding sense of dread. The leader perched himself on the edge of the table, his gaze fixed on Tom and Claire. I suppose you deserve to know why you're here, why we've gone through such lengths, he began, his tone almost conversational but laced with an underlying menace. He explained that their species, while advanced in many ways, coveted the unique properties of the human brain, its neural pathways, its capacity for creativity and emotional depth. These were aspects their species lacked but desperately needed to evolve. Your brains, he continued, are a resource, just like the minerals of a planet or the water of your oceans. We harvest what we need. We've done it before. Earth is just another stop in our journey. Tom felt a surge of anger and fear at the leader's callous revelation. This wasn't just an invasion, it was a systematic exploitation of the very essence of humanity. Claire, her voice trembling with rage and fear, spoke up. You can't just harvest people, treat us like cattle. The leader's smile was cold, devoid of empathy. But we can, and we do. Your species has been doing it to each other and to your planet for centuries. We are just more efficient at it. He stood up, his demeanor changing to one of stern authority. Your roles in this are simple. You will assist us. Your understanding of human behavior, Detective Tom, and your scientific expertise, Dr. Clare, will be invaluable as we expand our operations. Tom's fists clenched in defiance. 
We'll never help you, he spat out. The leader's expression didn't change. You will, in time. Everyone does. It's remarkable what the human mind can adapt to, given the right incentives. With that, he left the room, leaving Tom and Claire to grapple with their situation. They were fighting for the essence of what made humanity unique. The enemy they faced was seeking the annihilation of human individuality and creativity. Before being captured, Tom had managed to smuggle a small, concealable weapon. A last resort he'd hoped he wouldn't have to use. It was a compact, high-powered stun gun, hidden in a secret pocket of his tuxedo. Under the cover of darkness in their holding cell, Tom carefully retrieved the weapon, his movements quiet and precise. He showed it to Claire, her eyes reflecting a glimmer of hope amidst the fear. We might have one shot at this, he whispered, outlining a rudimentary plan of attack. Their captors, overconfident in their control, had become lax in their guard routines. Tom and Claire waited for the right moment when the changing of the guards happened. As the door opened for the routine check, Tom acted swiftly. He lunged at the nearest guard, the stun gun making contact and sending the guard into convulsions. Claire, quick to react, tackled the other guard, her scientific mind adapting to the dire physicality of their situation. They knew they had to move fast. Tom grabbed one of the guard's key cards and they slipped out of the cell into the corridor. The facility a maze of sterile, metallic hallways that seemed to stretch endlessly. The sound of their footsteps sounded ominously as they navigated the complex, constantly on the lookout for more guards. Every turn, every doorway was a risk. Tom and Claire moved with a blend of caution and urgency, aware that the alarm could be raised at any moment. Their hearts pounded in their ears, adrenaline fueling their desperate bid for freedom. As they turned a corner, they encountered two more guards. Reacting instinctively, Tom and Claire engaged in a frantic struggle. It was a chaotic, brutal dance with death, each movement driven by the primal need to survive. Tom's years on the Force had trained him for physical confrontations, but fighting alien beings with unknown capabilities was entirely different. Claire, despite her lack of combat training, displayed surprising resilience. They managed to overpower the guards, but not without sustaining injuries. Bruised and breathless, they pressed on, the realization that they might not make it out alive growing with each passing second. Finally, they found what looked like an exit, a large, reinforced door leading to the surface. Tom swiped the stolen keycard, holding his breath as the door slid open with a hiss. The cool night air hit them, but their escape was far from over. Alarms blared, the sound piercing the night as they emerged from the facility. Searchlights swept the area and guards poured out of the building. Tom and Claire ran with whatever strength they had left, zigzagging through the woods that surrounded the facility, bullets whizzing past them. The forest was dense, the terrain uneven and treacherous. They stumbled through underbrush, their bodies pushed to their limits. The sound of their pursuers served as indication of the danger on their heels. After what seemed like an eternity, they saw the lights of a distant highway. Using the last ounces of their energy, they emerged from the tree line, flagging down a passing car. The driver, startled by their disheveled appearance, hesitated, but the urgency in their voices convinced him to stop. As they drove away, the hidden facility fading into the night, Tom and Claire shared a look of exhausted relief. They had escaped, but their ordeal had only reinforced the dire reality they faced. The world needed to be warned, and they were the only ones who could do it. Tom and Claire, now safe but still reeling from their harrowing escape, found themselves in a dingy motel room on the outskirts of the city. The dim, flickering light of the room cast long shadows, mirroring the grim reality of their situation. They were fugitives, branded as criminals by the very entities they sought to expose. The urgency to act was overwhelming, 
but they faced a monumental challenge, convincing the world of an alien threat that seemed like the stuff of science fiction. Sitting on the edge of the bed with a map of the city spread out before them, Tom rubbed his bruised forehead. We need to get the word out, Claire, but we need solid proof. Without it, we're just two people with a conspiracy theory. Claire, her mind racing with scientific possibilities, responded, The substance in the politician's brain, the recordings from the gala, the data we collected on the Mimic network, we need to compile everything. But how do we disseminate it without getting dismissed as crackpots or worse, getting silenced? They knew the Mimics would be doing everything in their power to track them down and suppress the truth. Tom's network from his detective days could be a starting point, but even that was risky. Trust was a luxury they couldn't afford. We need someone with credibility. Someone the public trusts who can get the word out quickly, Tom suggested, his mind working through his contacts. What about a journalist? An investigative reporter with a reputation for uncovering the truth, Claire proposed, her eyes lighting up with a glimmer of hope. Tom nodded a plan forming in his mind. I might know someone. A reporter I worked with on a case years ago. She's known for her integrity and has the resources to get this story out. They worked through the night, compiling evidence and formulating their message. The recordings from the gala were key. They contained conversations that, while cryptic, suggested a coordinated effort to control human society. The scientific data on the alien substance added a layer of undeniable proof. As dawn broke, they made the risky decision to meet the reporter in person. Tom made the call from a burner phone, his voice low and urgent. It's Tom. I have a story, but it's bigger than anything you've ever covered. We need to meet. The reporter, skeptical at first, agreed to a clandestine meeting in a secluded park. Tom and Claire arrived early, surveying the area for any signs of surveillance. When the reporter arrived, they quickly relayed their story, the evidence laid bare on a park bench. The reporter listened, her initial skepticism turning to shock. This, this is huge. If what you're saying is true, the world needs to know. I'll need to verify some of this, but I can get the ball rolling. As they parted ways, Tom and Claire knew that the hardest part was still ahead. They had sown the seeds of truth, but the harvest was uncertain. The world's reaction was a variable beyond their control. They could only hope that the evidence would speak for itself and that humanity would listen. Tom and Claire knew that to truly expose the mimics, they needed a bold, public confrontation. The opportunity presented itself sooner than expected. The mimic leader, still masquerading as the influential diplomat Alexander Koenig, was scheduled to speak at a televised international policy forum, a gathering of global leaders and media. The plan was risky and required precise timing. They would be walking into the lion's den, but the high-profile nature of the event meant that any dramatic revelation would be broadcast worldwide. It was a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity to expose the mimics to the public and the global community. Tom and Claire arrived at the venue hours before the event, blending into the crowd of journalists, dignitaries and staff. They had managed to smuggle in a small camera, hoping to capture any evidence of Koenig's true nature on film. Their hearts pounded in their chests as the time for Koenig's speech neared. As Koenig took the stage, the audience hushed in anticipation. Tom and Claire positioned themselves strategically in the crowd. Koenig began his speech, eloquent and charismatic, discussing international cooperation and peace. To the unsuspecting audience, he was a visionary leader. To Tom and Claire, he was the face of an insidious alien threat. Midway through the speech, Tom made his move. He pushed through the crowd towards the stage, his voice loud and clear. Koenig, your lies end today, he shouted, drawing the attention of the audience and the live cameras. Chaos erupted in the hall. Security guards rushed towards Tom, but he stood his ground, pointing at Koenig. He's not human. He's an alien, part of an invasion. Koenig, momentarily caught off guard, quickly regained his composure. Is this some kind of joke? He said into the microphone 
trying to dismiss Tom's accusations with a laugh. But Tom persisted, his voice resonating through the hall. Look at him! He's one of them! They mimic us! They plan to harvest us! Tom continued, his gaze fixed on Koenig, challenging him to reveal his true form. The audience was filled with confusion and disbelief. Security finally reached Tom, grabbing him, but he struggled, his eyes still locked on Koenig. Tell them! Show them what you really are! In the commotion, Koenig's demeanor shifted. His calm facade cracked, revealing a flash of something inhuman in his eyes. It was a fleeting moment, but Tom saw it, and he knew others did too. Claire, amidst the chaos, managed to capture the moment on camera. She shouted out, corroborating Tom's claims, He's right! We have proof of their existence! Of their plan! The event turned into pandemonium, the audience members rising from their seats, some in fear, others in confusion. The live cameras captured every moment, broadcasting the confrontation to millions of viewers worldwide. The confrontation at the International Policy Forum had escalated beyond anything Tom or Claire could have anticipated. As they were being restrained by security, their eyes remained fixed on Alexander Koenig, the mimic leader. The crowd was in an uproar, a chaos of shouts and confusion filling the air. It was then that the unimaginable happened. Amidst the chaos, under the relentless glare of the live cameras and the eyes of the world, Koenig began to change. Perhaps it was the intensity of the moment or a loss of control under stress, but his human facade started to falter. The transformation was horrific and mesmerizing. Koenig's skin rippled and contorted, his features distorting into something bizarre. The audience gasped and recoiled in horror as his true form revealed itself. It was a sight straight out of a nightmare. His skin took on a grey, translucent quality. His eyes became large, black and unblinking, and his fingers elongated into slender, inhuman appendages. For a moment, time seemed to stand still. The world watched in stunned silence as the alien stood there, exposed and undeniable. The revelation was shocking, beyond what anyone could have prepared for. The truth that Tom and Claire had fought so hard to uncover was laid bare for all to see. Then, as quickly as it had gone quiet, the room erupted into chaos. People screamed and scrambled for the exits, tripping over each other in their haste to escape. The security guards, equally shocked, loosened their grip on Tom and Claire, their attention diverted to the alien being on stage. In the pandemonium, Tom and Claire found their chance to slip away. They moved quickly, blending into the crowd of frantic attendees. As they made their way out, they could hear the sounds of panic and confusion spilling out into the streets. The transformation had been broadcast live, and by now, the world was reacting in real time to the undeniable presence of an alien being. The revelation marked a turning point in human history. The existence of extraterrestrial life, once the subject of speculation and science fiction, was now a grim reality. As they emerged into the chaos outside the Forum, Tom and Claire knew that their mission had taken on a new dimension. The truth was out, but the future was uncertain. How would humanity respond to this revelation? What would the mimics do now that they had been exposed? These were questions for which they had no answers. In the days following the shocking revelation at the International Policy Forum, the world reeled from the impact of what had been unveiled. The footage of Koenig's transformation circulated endlessly on news networks and social media platforms, igniting a global conversation laced with fear, wonder and a call to action. Governments around the world were forced to acknowledge the reality of the alien presence, Emergency meetings were convened, strategies formulated. The United Nations held a special session, addressing the alien threat and the need for global unity in response. Countries that had once been at odds found common ground in the face of this unprecedented challenge. Tom and Claire were now hailed as heroes. Their relentless pursuit of the truth had saved humanity from a clandestine invasion. Interviews and news segments featured their story, 
painting them as the vanguard of human resistance against the alien mimics. While they were lauded publicly, both felt a deep sense of loss. The world they had known was forever altered, the innocence of humanity's solitude in the universe irrevocably shattered. The revelation also sparked a surge in global defense efforts. Military budgets were increased, and new protocols were established for identifying and dealing with mimics. Science and technology experienced a renaissance fueled by the need to understand and counter the alien threat. Claire became a leading figure in this new scientific frontier, her expertise sought by governments and research institutions worldwide. Tom, meanwhile, grappled with the new reality. His role in exposing the mimics had made him a saviour, but he struggled with the burden of what they had uncovered. The world was more united than ever, but it was a unity born of fear and uncertainty. The mimics, now exposed, retreated into the shadows. Incidents of mimic activity decreased, but the threat lingered, an invisible spectre haunting humanity's steps into the future. The possibility of further encounters or even retaliatory strikes hung over the world like a dark cloud. In this new world, security and vigilance became paramount. Surveillance technologies advanced rapidly, privacy becoming a casualty in the quest for safety. People looked at each other with solidarity and suspicion, wondering if the person next to them was truly human. For Tom and Claire, the aftermath was a bittersweet victory. They had achieved what they set out to do, but at the cost of a simpler, more innocent world. They continued to work together, navigating the new challenges of this altered reality, their bond strengthened by the trials they had faced. The world was still adjusting to its new reality, its newfound unity against the alien threat, when the skies changed again. It was a clear evening, the stars shining brightly, when suddenly they were obscured by a sight that sent a wave of terror across the globe. Large, ominous ships, dwarfing any man-made structure, appeared in the sky. They were unlike the first wave of mimics that had infiltrated society. These were the harbingers of a second wave, an armada that filled the horizon. The arrival was silent, but the message was clear. A larger, more direct invasion was at hand. Emergency broadcasts filled the airwaves and people across the world looked up in disbelief and fear. The initial victory over the mimics felt insignificant in the face of this new threat. Tom and Claire, who had barely begun to grasp the enormity of the aftermath, found themselves facing an even greater challenge. They stood among the crowds in the streets, looking up at the alien ships, their size and technology beyond anything known to man. The fear was a tangible force that gripped the heart. Governments scrambled jets and readied defences, but it was evident that humanity was outmatched. The alien ships remained stationary, their intentions unknown, but their mere presence was a psychological siege. Panic spread as people speculated about the purpose of this second wave. Were they here to finish what the first wave started? To conquer? To annihilate? The United Nations called for calm, urging the populace not to give in to fear. World leaders communicated with each other, formulating strategies and contingencies. This was no longer a hidden invasion but a blatant display of power and intent. The alien threat had united humanity, but this new development tested the limits of that unity. Tom and Claire knew they had to act. With the world watching, they addressed the public through a global broadcast. They spoke of resilience, of the need to stand together in the face of a common enemy. Their words were a rallying cry, a call to arms for every human being to contribute to the defense of their planet. As the world prepared for what might come, scientists, including Claire, worked to understand the alien technology to find a weakness. The military strategized, creating a defense plan that spanned continents and oceans. It was a global effort, unprecedented in scale and cooperation. The second wave of ships remained ominously still in the skies, a silent ultimatum to a world on the brink. Tom and Claire, along with leaders and citizens of the world, prepared for what was to come. 
They had faced the unknown before, but this was different. This was a test of the very survival of humanity. The world held its breath, waiting for the next move in this cosmic chess game. The second wave highlighted the vastness of the universe, emphasizing that humanity was only starting to comprehend its complexities and dangers.